Well, everybody, I am so excited. Um, I don't know about you, but if you were a Generation Xer growing up, listen to the radio, you've heard the group Super Tramp. You had to have heard the group Super Tramp. And I have. <laughs> and um, I loved their songs. I loved them. And I loved the sax solos and the woodwind solos and all that kind of thing. And I never thought that I'd, I'd ever have the opportunity to interview John Anthony Helliwell, who was the woodwinds player, the saxophone player for Super Tramp, and he's here right now on the Everything Saxophone podcast. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. Good day to you, and uh, very nice chatting intercontinentally. That's right. He's across the pond <laughs> in the UK, yeah. and I'm here in Los Angeles. Um, oh my gosh! So, you know, so many, so many people are going to be so excited about this. So. I wanted to ask this question just to start off with. I, I always like asking about people's beginnings and stuff. And I was surprised to read that you started um, you started on clarinet. That's not the surprising thing, but you started age 13. So I'm wondering, did you play any other musical instruments before you started clarinet? Or did you, you know, you just started everything at age 13? I, I had one year of uh, piano lessons when I was nine. And uh, that, that was good because I learned both uh, the clefs and learnt about music and how music was written. And uh, just at school, I played the recorder. Uh, and then when I was 30, when I was, uh, yeah, 30, uh, 11, I heard um, a, a particular clarinet player play a, a particular tune. I'll tell you what it was. And I thought, oh, that sounds nice. Uh, maybe I could, if I play a recorder, maybe I can play clarinet because it's you put your fingers like this and... Uh, so it, this was a, a, a clarinet player called Monty Sunshine, and he was with the Chris Barber's Jazz Band, and he was playing a, a tune called Petite Fleur by Sidney Bechet. I thought that was really cool. And so I saved up my pocket money for two years. Oh, wow. And bought a clarinet. And the clarinet was 15 pounds when I finally bought it. Uh, and... Uh, and it sort of went from there. And I, I found a local guy to give me some lessons. And uh, I, I really enjoyed really enjoyed playing it. That's how I started. That's awesome. And um, OK, so you started off with some lessons. Was he the only person that you ever studied one-on-one uh, -on -one privately with? Yes. Wow. OK. So until I was until I was 47. And I, I did I did some studying later. But back then, in uh, when I was 13, uh, yeah, that was it. Uh, and I, I played in the and just I played with him in the local orchestra because he he was sitting in the the local orchestra and I sat next to him and, and played a bit. And then I played a little bit at school, although it was just it wasn't like you you may imagine a school having a band and an orchestra and all that. It wasn't anything like that. We just sometimes we got a group together and played maybe for a Christmas party or something. Uh, so it was it was just little bits and pieces back then. Wow. So it wasn't a, a very, uh, I'll use the word, it wasn't a very rich musical background. Um, you heard a recording, Sidney Bechet recording, that you liked and you saved it your money <laughs> you know, for two years. Yeah. You got a clarinet, you took some lessons for, I guess, you know, a little while, a short while. But then I guess the lessons came from not necessarily playing in your school but playing along with him when how long yeah. after you started did you did you play along with him oh it was, it was quite soon because wow. uh, somebody recommended him because i needed to know really what to do how to play it you know how, how to approach this instrument yeah, but at the same time i started listening to uh, some jazz on the radio and and that was very very few and far between where you, where you could find it there was a program called the voice of america once a week, and we, I used to listen to this jazz program on there, and uh, I heard various people, and um, there was a very popular clarinet player in the UK called Acker Bilk. He had a big hit with a number called Stranger on the Shore. So I'd heard clarinet playing and everything, but then when I heard, when I eventually when I heard people like Sonny Rollins and John Coltrane and uh, Art Blakey, Miles Davis, and Cannonball Adderley. They, they all, especially Cannonball. It was, uh, it was just like, wow. Now, now here's something. So here was, in my imagination, here was an alto saxophone. So, when I was 15, 
I managed to buy an alto saxophone. It's an alto. Okay, got it. So it yeah, so I started off on alto with with Cannonball as my main inspiration there. Uh, so then the, my musicality was was flowering a little bit by then. Did you teach yourself jazz? Yeah, more or less, just listening. Wow. Can okay, if you could remember, can you go into that more? You said just listening. So like, what would you get a record? You listen to it. You would try to figure it out. Like, what would you do? How is he? Do, what the hell are they doing? Yeah, well, back then, uh, and it was just. Basically, it was my inspiration, and I, I just started playing with different people, played in a little dance band, and then played with various people when I was just still at school. And then and then when I was 18, I left school and went to the big city, Birmingham it was, and um, I became a computer programmer. That was that was what I was doing then. But in my spare time, I, I I went to a few jam sessions and probably made a fool of myself. Just uh, and then I got into a various groups around that time. Just uh, sort of not. It wasn't really rock. It was like blues groups or something. It wasn't really jazz then. And but I, I was really enjoying jazz uh, for for listening to. So I um, and there was one moment which kind of t turned me around and I it, I was about 19 and uh, I went to this city called Coventry and there was a jazz club there and I went because there was a, a quite a famous ten tenor saxophone player called Toby Hayes was playing with his quintet okay. and Toby was fantastic great great player played tenor saxophone flute and vibes in fact but I went to this club and I was really, really enjoying his, his set. And he finished the first set and I wandered out. And it was a big club with, with one or two floors. And there was this other music, other music happening downstairs. I thought, oh, I wonder what this is. And I went into this room and it was a, a it was a rhythm and blues group called the Graham Bond Organization. Okay. And Graham Bond played organ and sang. He had a saxophone player called Dick Hextel Smith, and the rhythm section was Jack Bruce, uh, was Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker from Cream. Oh. They were the two, two of the original guys in in Cream. So there was this is before Cream, of course, and I was really taken with this music, this new music to me. It was it was R and B type music, and uh, so so taken in fact that I stayed for the rest of the evening and listen to these guys instead of going to my favorite saxophone player upstairs. So that, that was a turnaround. And that was about 19, uh, oh gosh, I don't know, 1964 or something like that. Oh, okay. All right. And so that was a huge turnaround for you. What, what happened after that in terms of, you know, how you were, I guess, approaching music and, and that kind of thing? Well, I was in a blues, a sort of bluesish uh, group at the time. And, uh, we made a decision to tr uh, try and turn professional. So I gave up my job as a computer programmer and we went to live in London. Um, we didn't we didn't get a lot of gigs, but we enjoyed what we were doing. But it didn't last very long. That group broke up. So I reached a, a, another crossing point in my life, and that was I, I didn't have a job, so I had to do something. So uh, I tried for a, a job as a computer programmer in Sweden, uh, and I didn't go to Sweden, but it was the job was in Sweden. And at the same time, I applied in the Melody Maker, which is a, 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 a musician's paper in, in, in the UK, for a job working with, with anyone, a band or something. And I got, I got two offers. I got an offer of a, job, a computer job in Sweden, and I got an offer from a guy called Alan Baum to play in this Alan Baum set. And I took the one, the music one, and that was in 1965. So I took that one, and uh, I won't say I never looked back, but um, uh, that was the right way to go, obviously. Uh, yeah. So I was with this, I was with this Alan Baum band for oh, five, five or six years, and we we played all over the UK. We were we were a good club band. I made several albums. I had one or two vocalists, including. Jess Roden and Robert Palmer. Do you know Robert Palmer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was he was in that band. Wow. And um, 
the band had formed prior to my joining the band had formed a couple of years earlier it was it originally was the john barry seven john barry is a film composer you've heard his music with james bond films and stuff so this john barry had was a trumpeter and he had his own band but he got too busy to uh, to do the band and write music. So he, he sort of gave this band to this guy, this trumpeter called Alan Bowne. And so Alan Bowne ran this band. Uh, and I joined that and was with that for several years. And so that was a good start. What did you play? Did you play, um, did you just play alto? Or what did, did you play more than one saxophone? What did you do? Yeah, I played alto and tenor mostly, mostly tenor. But I played alto and tenor. Didn't play, I? Don't think I played. I, I played a little bit of clarinet in that in that band. Yeah, we made some recordings. Yeah, yeah, um, and, I, and I played a little bit of recorder. Yeah, oh. so it was it was what I did. You know. When but, did you but, take up ten? When did you take up tenor? I uh, when I went to Birmingham to be a computer programmer. Oh, okay. okay. I got interested in in tenor, especially after hearing Sonny Rollins, John Coltrane, uh, uh, and I thought, well, I'll get myself a good tenor. And I bought brand new. I bought a Selma Mark VI tenor saxophone. This is 1964. Oh. It was 145 pounds, include with a case, brand new, fantastic, good horn, very good horn. I didn't realize at the time how good it was, you know. Yeah. But there's there's a nice little story later in my life about that, that instrument. Uh, but that's what I did then. So um, that was the Mark VI. And they're worth thousands now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, so... What have, you, what have you got behind there? What's that one? Okay, so that one is my Trevor James. Um, oh, yeah. Great horn, great horn. It, and, and I also have a Mark VI from... I think mine is... Um, 1968 or so great horn this has the, the trevor james is a solid horn it really feels good um the key work feels like the mark six so yeah good i've never tried one of those yeah it's a great horn it's a great horn for sure so all right so you then you 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 know you start on tenor when you were um in birmingham and stuff like that so yeah you're playing you know you're playing tenor alto um you know, a little bit of clarinet, a little bit of recorder and stuff like that. And then you were in the Alan Baum band, Alan Baum band for five years. So yeah. yeah, keep going with your history. This is interesting. Well, we reached a point where we, we, we all got fed up of Alan Baum and we, we, we all, we tried to leave and we, 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 most of us that were in the band left and we formed a group called, which we called wizard. And, um, when we went to do our first gig at a, at a small place in, in London somewhere, halfway through the gig, the, the manager of, of the Alan Bound group came along and he took all our equipment. So he said it was his. So he, and, and he took the van. So we ended up with, with nothing. So, you know, no equipment, no van and everything. So uh, we, that band kind of folded. And then it was then that... I started to do a series of other gigs in in cabaret clubs, strip clubs, and then also backing up uh, visiting U.S. soul singers. Wow. Uh, uh, Jimmy Ruffin from Motown, uh, Arthur Connolly from the bandwagon, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy, somebody. I'll remember in a minute. I'm backing up these 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 people, which I got to know a few other musicians, and then and then in uh, early '73, I went over to work with a, a guy in Germany called Pete Lancaster, and he had a band, and it was with some of the musicians that I had met backing up the Americans, and we had a band there playing in Germany, we were playing at U.S. air bases, basically. It was a good band. The guy, the, the 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 guy that ran it, Pete, was a bit like uh, sang a bit like Ray Charles and played organ, and it, it was a good, good grounding, good good for me to play. I was getting a little bit better, and while I was in Germany, getting a bit homesick, um, I I managed to telephone. It was it was different in those days. You had to book a telephone call at the local sort of post office, 
and go to a little booth in the wall. And, you know, there were no handhelds, no mobiles, no cell phones. Oh, that's this true. Is seven, this is 50 years ago, you know. I know, but still having to book a, fo- a regular phone yeah. call? I mean, yeah, yeah. so I called home and, and, and oh. my wife, Christine, said, um, oh, Dougie Johnson uh, just called uh, yesterday. He wants to know if you'd like to go down and, and uh, have a play with Supertramp. Now, one of the base one of the bass players uh, with the Alan Bound group towards the end of of its life um, was Dougie Thompson, who he and Dougie Thompson's the bass player with uh, Supertramp, of course. And in the meantime, while I'd been doing little jobs, he'd he'd been doing jobs, and and uh, he'd put um, a, a, an advert in, and and he'd joined Supertramp, and he'd been with them for about um, oh maybe a year, maybe nine months, maybe a year. And um, at that time, Supertramp had started in 69 and they'd made a couple of albums with a couple of different personnel. I didn't know that. Uh, and they hadn't had too much success, but they, they, were, they were thinking of trying to reform and make something really good at that time. Okay. So there was, there was the two songwriters, Rick Davis, Roger Hodgson, and there was Dougie Thompson, who I've just been talking about. Uh, they found a, a drummer they liked called Bob Siebenberg, an American who was playing in London at the time. Mm-hmm. And then Dougie and the boys, because I'd seen them a couple of times, uh, they thought of me to, to play the saxophone. And so that's why Dougie called. And uh, I said, I sent a message back because I couldn't call him. I had to get my wife to call, you know about 50 years ago, um, I said, yeah, well, I'm thinking of of coming back, quitting this job. I'll come down. So I went down the next week and, and stayed for 50 years. That's incredible. All right. That's an awesome story. And yeah, I was going to ask later, you know, gosh, it's 50 years, 50 years. <laughs> You've been in the band. Yeah. That's crazy. I just had my anniversary this, uh, this year because I remember the date because I, I wrote it down in, in, my, in my diary, July 7th. Oh, was it July 17 or July 19? Well, it was July. Anyway. Wow. That's incredible. That And, um, you know, you joined Supertramp, right? So talk a little bit about, about the beginnings of Supertramp for you. I know you said that they started in 1969, but, you know, what was that experience like? It was good. I seemed to really fit in. Um, we, we, got, we had a good thing going between us, uh, and it was – it became – more than the sum of its parts, if you know what I mean. And it all based around the, the, the two different songwriters and the instruments that they played. Rick plays keyboards, and then Roger plays key- keyboards and guitar. And then we had bass and drums and saxophone. And I can do a bit of keyboards, so it was, it was quite good... Um, especially when we came to play live, uh, that I could do a little fill-in for string sounds and keyboards. Because we, we had quite a hard job uh, playing live because we're playing music, which is like 48 tracks or something like that, that you finally mix down to two, you know, and you're listening to the to that stereo image. And um, then you have to try and reproduce this music on stage but just with five people so it, it's quite hard you've just got to take the best bits and try and manage manage it but that was one one of the things that we became successful because we were quite good at doing that okay and we were quite uh our, the music and the show was the main thing it wasn't just uh, that was our thing is the music and not just showbiz sort of stuff you know Right. But, and, and that, that was the thing too. Like, you know, the, the, your music was, um, there was a lot to it. You know what I mean? A lot of like instrumentation and all that kind of thing. And I find it interesting how you're talking about this now. It is hard to reproduce what you put on a record when you're putting, you know, all these different types of instruments or, you know, just filling up the sound and then to try to, to yeah. re- reproduce that on a stage is not easy. I'm no, curious. that's, yeah, it's definitely. And, and I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned, and I know this, you played keys and stuff like that. When did you pick up keys? Well, uh, 
before when I was nine, when I had piano right. lessons. So I knew I knew how to put my fingers on a keyboard. I'm not a virtuoso or anything, but um, just okay. playing like string pads and lines, melody lines on synthesizers that were just coming out at that time. Uh, we used a Moog synthesizer, but we used one called an Oberheim, which I don't know whether people remember nowadays, but it was it was one of the really cool synths then. It used to go out of tune a lot. You had to spend ages trying to really trying to fiddle with it and tune it. Yeah, wow. it was an eight voice Oberheim, and we had a, an Elka Rhapsody string machine that was an Italian, and then of course with the keyboards we used. I, I didn't play actually pianos very much because that was Rick and Roger's uh, side of things. But we had grand piano and we had well, the Wurlitzer electric piano. That That's a kind of super tramp sound like, like you hear on Dreamer. Okay. Got it. And so you, so what, I guess my question was, yeah. So you kept up your keys chops, so to speak, or all, yeah. all those years. It just was, you know, it wasn't like a main instrument per se, but you just kept up your keys chops, which probably yeah. helped you with all the other instruments as well. Yes, it was good to when I started playing the, the clarinet and saxophone. Is that I, I knew what a, a, a treble clef looked like, and right, right. I knew notes and music, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, I I want to dive back a little bit. Um, done. You've done a lot of playing up to this point, even up to 1973 and stuff like that. The one thing that you know we mentioned, you had a few lessons in the beginning. You know, you sat in with your your, your teacher, so to speak, for a little bit. How did you learn improvisation? Like, what did you do to learn improvisation? Listen, just listen to not not hundred percent saxophonists, but I like listening to all sorts of instrumentalists, guitarists. I like to listen to singers. Uh, just trying to pick up pick up stuff. Nothing specific, but just get the feelings from. Uh, and it, it took a long it took a long time because the thing is you. In order to improvise, you've, you've got to be quite good, or it helps to be quite good technically on, on your instrument. But, uh, so I, but I, I didn't really know what I was doing. It's like I was trying to swim by just jumping into the sea, you know. Yeah, but yeah. I managed, managed to keep afloat a bit uh, and just, just got better. But um, it was interesting because the, 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 the influences of jazz and then the R&B sort of music that I've been playing – it, it it was nice how that joined up with the influences that were in Supertramp. And they were du a duality between the Beatles and S Beatles for Roger Hodgson and say, uh, Rick Davis used to be a sort of jazz drummer. So there's a jazz big band influence in there. And then there's a surf in influence from Bob Seidenberg, the drummer. Um, people bring in different things, but the, the whole thing gelled together really well. Uh, and well, it, it's, it was just that kind of magic that happens when five people get together that, that seems to work. Yeah. And, you know, this. what's also interesting, and a lot of people may not realize, too, you know, when, when it comes to being in a band, and you've, you've said this already, you know, there, there's personalities, right? Everybody has their own personalities and stuff like that. And you'd think that, wow, they're in this incredibly successful band. And then you're like, you know, you're so upset to hear like people break up, people leave, all that kind of thing. But you all stayed together for quite a while. Yeah, for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. We had quite a, we had a good period of success throughout the seventies and the beginnings of the eighties. And then uh, something which Roger Hodgson had been wanting to do seem, seemingly for ages. <laughs> Roger left the band. He wanted to to be more productive on his own or whatever. And the other th three of us stayed with Rick and carried on with Supertramp through the 80s, 90s, and then kind of desultory through the beginning of this century. And, you know, we toured occasionally. We weren't very prolific during those years, but we made a few albums. Got it. Yeah. So, you know, when, when Roger first left, so, you know, how did you all take that? You know, what was that like? Well, it was it was a, a a blow really because he left at the peak of of our success yeah. after after breakfast in America and after one of the most successful tours in seventy nine, and then we had an album called Paris, the live album, and that was doing really well. And then Roger decided to leave, and so we we carried on 
playing and the first recording we made was was uh, brother way you bound and it was it it became a serious album because the, the music had got slightly frivolous on occasion with uh with tunes like the, uh, the logical song or I mean, not that the, there's a frivolity it's not frivolous in terms of um the the contents of the lyrics but the music was kind of chaunty and poppy and we decided that we, we would do something slightly more serious to, to get away from that and we we had an album called brother way bound which was uh, it, it was nice it set us on a nice direction that's interesting though because the logical song um is, was one of your most famous hits <laughs> oh yeah yeah it was great great yeah but it was a different type of pop in my mind. You know, it was it wasn't um this wasn't like bubblegum pop in in, no. I mean, in my in my view, not at all. I mean it was it was complex, you know, there was there were a lot there was a lot to it. Yes, I, exactly. It took it took us a long time to to make recordings and but I think we got it right in the end. Yeah. <laughs> um for sure. Now I I want to I want to dive back a little bit to, you know, we talked about improvisation and stuff like that. Um I have to say this, like your solos in, you know, give a little bit also. Uh but the logical song Take the Long Way Home. Um they're iconic. They really are. So I uh, I'm just curious, you know, um you know, a lot of times when you're in the, re in the recording studio, we don't just do one take, we do many takes, but how um, how many takes did it take, <laughs> no pun intended, for you to do, you know, the, some of those iconic solos? Right. Um, usually uh, the first take. Wow. But, uh, for example, uh, with uh, the logical song, we went in and we got we we got set up. Uh, this took weeks of setting up for the whole album, but we got set up for the logical song, and there was no room for the for the saxoph for the saxophone because they'd taken the piano in one room and the drums in another, and so they'd run out of room. So we, I, I got put in the toilet for that. I was in the toilet, right? So I couldn't see them, but I could hear everything. And and we did uh, what we call just a, a, a backing track, which would just be bass, drums, and piano, for example. Okay. And a, maybe some guide vocals. Uh, and, and I put the saxophone on, on the track as well at the same time. And so we, we cut, I would think about six, uh, my guess is we, we cut about six versions of that. And I played on every one. And then... We took the the basic track without the saxophone and without the vocals, and we made six versions, many mini mixes of the versions, and we all took them, we all took it home with us, so we could listen and find out which one was the best, which one we thought was the, the best one. And we came back the next day, and everybody said track three or something. We like that one. Oh, they said, oh, great. Oh, so we'll listen to this and we'll see what's the saxophone like on this, you know. Is it any good? So turn it up and that was it. That was a solo. That was the one. Wow. So it didn't need to be redone. It, it was there. So there must have been, my, my thinking about it is there must have been a spirit there, you know, that 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 made me play well on it or whatever you, whatever you do. Yeah. That and with... Yeah, with, with other tracks, generally a, a first one was very good. And there's there's one exception to this. Not my fault. Um, no, we were recording in back in seventy uh, back in seventy three. We were recording "Crime of the Century" the album and that and the track "Crime of the Century." So we 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 played through, and there's it, it ends with a, a big saxophone solo at, you know at the end so i did what was what i considered to be a, a good solo everybody liked it yeah this is great yeah quite good so and then a week or two later we were thinking um, yeah let's put some strings on this then so we got a string arranger in and he did two or three numbers and he put the strings on crime of the century without listening to the saxophone just just listening to the basic track which at the end goes just goes on for a couple of minutes or more so richard houston put the strings on 
and um, we, went, we went and recorded it, and it sounded great. Yeah, so let's hear what this sounds like with the turn the saxophone. Didn't work, didn't work at all with what I'd already played. So I had to. What I did then was uh, with uh, with Rick Davis, the composer. Uh, I sort of created a solo, which was meant to have little uh, vignettes of little parts of the melodies of other songs that were on the that are on the album. Okay. But don't ask me what what they are now. I don't know. I don't know. But we we sort of constructed a solo that was a bit like the old one, but one that fitted in with the strings. So that that long little story there is just to tell you that it's normally first take, but not always. <laughs> That's a cool story. I, I've got to ask this question. Okay, um, do you all did someone keep that track of your original first solo? No, just throw oh. away. Oh, wow. that would have been nice. That would have been nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. No, never thought of that. <laughs> that would have been a great. Oh my gosh, that would have been a great like B side or something like that, or alternate take, or you know later on putting out the album. Here's some of the alternate takes that you, <laughs> you all did and stuff. Yeah, like it was that. a good one. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I can't try to think of. Uh, no, there's an opposite story to that in that when we were making. Famous Last Words, which was the last album we made with Roger, and we were making it at Roger's studio. And Roger, um, I don't think you mind me saying that, sometimes he, he changes his mind a lot, Roger, and he was kind of in charge. of. He, he was doing one of his numbers that's on that album. I can't remember which one. And there's a clarinet solo in it. And... Uh, I did. Everybody thought the clarinet solo was great, but one night Roger was listening to it, and for some reason he didn't like the clarinet, so so he wiped it. He wiped wiped it, and, and everybody was really mad at him. So that's something that had to be done again. You know, it wasn't entirely a mis. It turned out to be a mistake. I mean, I managed to do it another one at some stage, but it's not nice having your good work wiped. Yeah, <laughs> especially when it wasn't entirely like you know. The, there was a guy that uh, that wiped a track of uh, Steely Dan at one time uh, when the Steely Dan were making an album, and he got fired, of course. Uh, but it, it's been a sort of industry uh, secret, you know, about things like that. Yeah, no, for sure, and 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 you know. Um, being in the studio is hard work. You know, it really is. I mean, there's all the, yeah. the all the prep before it, but you know, um, getting everything ready and all that kind of stuff. And it's it's also the pressure, too. And you know what I I wanted to ask actually, um, I want to get away from the studio just for one second. When you are playing live, right? And you know, Super Tramp, you know, just just you're known for for having a great live performance as well. That you know sounds just like the album, just as good as the album and stuff like that. Did you ever feel pressure to play the recorded solos that you would come up with in the studio? Oh, yeah. Some of them seemed to, I, I kept uh, with the logical song solo, for example. Um, I kept uh, quite a few elements of, of that playing live. I did alter it a bit, but it, it wasn't a different solo every night. It, it, it would start off. The same way because it worked so well, um, so I would keep I would keep good strong elements of, of that solo. Yes, that's what that's what I was wondering because um, you know because again I've listened to you know obviously the recording and and some of the live ones too. And I was thinking, you know, for a lot of people, a lot of people that listen to this podcast, you know, they often um, they have the question, you know, do I play the famous recorded solo or do I create my own? And I was wondering for you as the artist, ah. you know. Well, it's a different situation if you've already created it in the first place. Yeah. I think you've got a little more leeway to be able to play it. Um, and, yes, it's it's difficult for, for someone who's, who's playing somebody else's solo, for example. Um, I wouldn't know know what to say. If you can come up – if you think you can come up with something really, really good – yeah, go for it. But maybe it's okay to to, to play this the what your version of the recorded solo. Maybe that's okay because that if you if you're in a band that, that's specifically playing the music, say of Supertramp or whatever, the people who are going there, 
they, they really want to hear the more like the original, don't they? I would imagine. I would think so. Like when I, you know, yeah. I first started playing cover bands and stuff like that, I was always under the assumption that I had to play, you know, I had to learn the original solo, obviously, but also play that because, you know, I was thinking the audience would want to hear that. But, you know, it really, it again, when you're in a cover band, it's all different types of songs. You know, most of the time the audience, they're focusing on the singer. Um, they may yeah. remember certain elements of, you know, key elements, like you mentioned, of the the recorded solos, but not necessarily be like, you know, saxophone players would be like, if I'm going to a show, you know, I'm going to remember certain, I'm going to remember certain solos, whereas someone else going who's not a saxophone player, who's not a musician, won't. So it makes it, you know, yeah. makes it a little tricky in, in that way. Uh, but I was just curious for you. You know, like you said, you had a little bit leeway when it comes to that. You could play what you had, you know, done with the recorded solos. I, but I also think of groups like Queen, you know, with the guitar solos and stuff and, and you know, feeling the need to keep replicating that, you know, night after night and stuff like that. That could also be really tiring, too. Yeah. Um, interesting. Overall, with Supertramp, we, we kept... Uh, uh, we kept to the sort of basics of, of the tunes that we produced because the, the music is quite complex. And so it took us a long time to learn how to do it and get it right. Uh, and But that's okay for us because we're not like a blues group that can go and get stoned and just play off, play, you know, play, play for three hours. We're not the Grateful Dead or whatever playing their music. We were, you know, like a rock pop band and, our music was well. I I used to call our music sophisto rock, uh, you know. So it was kind of sophisticated rock music. So we, we we had we had to keep it within certain limits because we had to produce those sounds. I love that sophisto rock. I think that's awesome because <laughs> it is. It really is. It's it's again like I said before. It's not I, bubblegum music. I thought it fit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, absolutely. Like I said, you know, and, and what, what people don't realize too. So, um, and I'll say this now, it was like nine years ago. Um, I had contacted you via email, my old email address and stuff like that. And, you know, I just, I, I don't know what, what inspired me. I must have heard or read something or whatever. Um, uh, but I was like, I just want to know what equipment he was using. <laughs> oh yes. Yes. I remember that. Yeah. Auto link metal. That's right. Great. That's right. Yeah. So so wait, so what did you use just for our, our listeners? So when you were recording those albums with Super Tramp, um, what was the equipment that you were using? Well, I think on the Alto, uh, it was probably a Mayer number seven. Wow. I think. Yeah. Um, I play an old Selma now. I think I get a better sound on it. It's a 50s Selma hard rubber mouthpiece. It's a, It's an... I think it's an E or an F. It's quite open, but it's it's a good sound. That's on Alto. And back then, I didn't have the Auto Link metal one that uh, I use nowadays. Uh, I had a, a a hard rubber Auto Link, I think, and I think it was a seven, the same as the Auto. Um, that's. But when when I go back. Those 50 years to crime of the century, I can't really remember what I was playing, to be honest. Yeah. It might have been a Brillhart. Okay. It might have been a Brillhart level air. I think that's what you wrote in the email to me. Yeah, I think it was. Okay. Oh, did I? Oh, well, I think so. Yeah. It, that, that sounds familiar. That sounds familiar to me. Um because because I'm just thinking to myself too, well, you, again, you're, you know, you're in this, this sophisticated rock band, right? And um people will be very interested to hear that you played, you know, on alto, like a Meyer seven. And how would that, you know, how would that cut through? But, you know, again, you're running your sound and all that kind of thing. You can make that happen. Um, but I think they're going to be surprised to hear, you know, a, a Meyer seven on an alto and not like some kind of metal piece or something like that. Ah, Now the thing is my thing about sound is, is to try and get a, a, a full, a full, big, a big sound. That's why I kind of concentrate on tenor at the moment, but um, so that's my thing is getting a full big sound. I don't want to get on any instrument a shrill cutting type of sound. I want to get the best acoustic sound. I, I don't need, I didn't need in the band 
to cut through, you know, to cut through all other instruments because I, I could mic it and, and make my sound. But I, I've always had a problem with alto, that, thinking that I sound a bit on the thin side, you know. It, perhaps it's just, it's not my complete speciality instrument. But um, So I've always favoured mouthpieces which give the biggest sound, you know, that I can get, even though my, my overall sounds, maybe I think it's a bit thin. That's interesting. You that you, that, I, can't, I can't believe that. That's interesting that you think that, but I think it's more, um, it could be <clears throat> that you resonate with the sound of the tenor, the fullness of the tenor, even though you start on clarinet, but um, it could be like, you know, we all tend to gravitate towards the voices that resonate with us, you know, so like, yes. people, you know what I mean? So like, yeah, that's, that's happened to me. Yeah. In this last few years, I've, I've made a few recordings, quite a few recordings and, it's mostly on tenor and clarinet. The clarinet's kind of different, but I, I like playing clarinet. I like I like the I really like the woodiness of it as opposed to the well saxophone is it's not woody, it's more metallic, but um I, I, I like playing clarinet. I'm still struggling to play these these instruments though, after all these years. I don't know if people would agree with that, but <laughs> uh, you're always you always can learn. In fact, there was a point in um, 1992 or so that I I went to college. I, I won't say I went back to college because I never went in the first place, but I decided to go and study. So I came, I actually moved back from California where I've been living for 17 years because okay. the band all came out in 75 from UK to California, and we all lived around. I decided to come back to the UK, and I just I studied at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. Oh wow! So I decided to study the saxophone after all those years. It was it was quite interesting. Yeah, but I I still learned a lot, you know. Yeah, can you talk about good. that? Yeah, can you talk about yeah. that? So you went. So how did that feel? You know, going going. I don't want to use the word back to, but going to college you know, much later and taking up saxophone and, you know, having uh, probably a lot younger people in there with you at the same time. That must have been, that must have felt kind of weird. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were mostly about th almost 30 years younger than myself. And, um, but it was quite interesting because I'd had all the experience, which they hadn't had. Yeah. And they, they were, they were really good players, of course, you know, and, Technically, probably technically a lot better than me, but but I had the age and experience. But it was interesting, though, that at college, I'd never really played before that in a big band. And there was a big band at college, which I got into and really enjoyed that. And I played in orchestras, which I'd never done before, a lot of modern music. Um, and I learned a lot in those years. Yeah, and, and this is we're going to get into this in a couple of minutes, but you know, your latest projects have been with the super big tramp big band. So I'm curious oh. that you're, I'm thinking that your college years in 92 and such probably somehow <laughs> came full circle here with, you know, what you're doing now. Yes, it's all part of the life's rich tapestry, you know. I was there at that college and then I got busy again. I was actually w went to play with, with Roger Hodgson on one of his projects and then uh, more Supertramp music came up in 1997 uh, and then more touring. And um, in the meantime, I'd, I'd met some good musicians in Manchester. And um, jumping ahead, this is about 10 years ago, the, the man that ran the student big band at, at the college in Manchester, uh, he called me and he said, Look, why don't we do a project where I'll get several arrangers and we'll arrange Supertramp music for big band. And then you can come along and be a guest and, and we'll do a concert. And yeah, that's a great idea. So several people who I knew uh, uh, made arrangements, uh, uh, Bloody Well Right, The Logical Song, all sorts, uh, and, and arrangements for a 19-piece big band. This is in 2013. And uh, the concert went really well. It was great. And uh, there was one of the one of the professors there, the professor of saxophone, Rob Buckland. He said to me, "Let's do this. Let's do this for real with pro musicians and everything." So 
um, eventually, after a few years, that that came into effect, uh, and we started uh, and got got it all together with uh, with a, a good band. Did one or two uh, concerts, and then we were going to do a recording, and then COVID hit, bang, oh. and knocked everything for six. Uh, anyway, we eventually got it recorded. Uh, we got it recorded about eighteen months ago, and uh, it's it, we're going to re- it's going to be released at some stage in the future. And it, it's really interesting, and it's it's uh, it's all super tramp tunes without vocals, uh, just arranged for a, a big band. So, that so with sense. me as the chief the chief soloist. Now, li- listen, so, um, and I'm going to put the links in the show notes, everybody, um, but, you know, you have links on your website, and I'm listening to this, I'm like, oh, my God, this is good. <laughs> it's a really great. Yeah, well, the, great the, uh, it's, a, it's good, and it, it, it's, a, it's called the Super Big Tramp Band, so that, that will come out at some stage. In the meantime, I've been making other recordings by, by myself and, you know, doing, doing stuff, yeah, so... Uh, it's quite fruitful at the moment. I mean, I consider myself to be semi-retired, but I, and I play with uh, with other people as well. I play with several people in Europe, you know, doing some tours here and there, and, and it's been it's been really nice. I, I'm surprised you said you're semi-retired because <laughs> you've got you've got your own albums coming out. You've and yeah. I, I've noticed uh, the latest the latest one. Wait, I love, forgot the name of it for a second. Um, right, don't ever oh, leave me. Right, so you're you're yeah, there, right there, awesome. And what's really what's really cool about this album, and and you know, listening to your your solo work, there's a, like, there's like a lot of ballads, <clears throat> yeah, on "Don't Ever Leave Me" and stuff like that, which is really interesting because it's different than you know, it's different than the, the super tramp music and stuff, and we can oh, yeah. hear you know all the jazz influences and that kind of thing. Um, so I thought that was really cool. Well, thank you. The, the, it's, I'm very proud of these. Uh, the, the last that, that album is is like a, this one's like a jazz quartet. Yeah. Or it is. It's piano, bass, drums, saxophone, and then I made this one about three four years ago, just before COVID. It was, and this is with a string quartet and Hammond organ, and that's that's ballads too. I like ballads, uh, and that's a really nice medium to be to be working in. I can see that because yeah. you're such a melodic because your solos were so melodic, you know. Um, that's why I said like they're so they were so iconic, and uh, it's cool that you said you most of them were like first take, right? But just thinking about that, you know, how melodic your solos were, and coming full circle, you've done these two albums, more to come, right? Um, yeah. But you know, the melody takes the precedence for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's 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 what that's the full circleness of this. And then going, you know, to college in 1992 and having the um, you know, the ability to be in big bands and orchestras and stuff like that. And then 2013 that project and now the recording with Super Big Tramp. Um I can I can just see that because when we spoke about a number of minutes ago how the arrangements of of Super Band of Super Super Tramp music were intricate. That's what I was looking for this whole time. Intricate arrangements, yeah. intricate sophisto pop, right? Um, sophisto rock. You know, it's so intricate. You could see how a big band, an orchestra, can play super tramp music because yeah, it's, it's, good. it's that intricate. Yeah, I think I've realized uh, the solos with super tramp seem to really fit well, and and I said that quite a few of them, of them were first takes, but. Having said that, we'd be we'd possibly been playing a tune for for a, a year or or more, two years or six months or three years. We'd been going over the tunes, you know, because there was a backlog of tunes before we made an album with Supertramp. So we'd been playing this music for a long time. So I'd been playing solos in this in the same tune for a long, long time before we ever went in the studio to record it. So I, I really knew where I was in the tune. You know, it, it wasn't like I was constructing a solo to repeat all the time, but I just knew, I really knew the tune well. And that I think that was one of the reasons why Supertramp tunes sounded so good played by the five of us, because 
we played them a lot before we ever recorded them. It wasn't like we just went in the studio and cut them. We just heard them that morning. Um, you know, we'd been playing them for ages. That's different, though, when you think about it. Most most bands um, wouldn't... And when you say you play them a lot, before I ask this other question, did you play them a lot live or just play them a lot, you know, just like rehearsing and stuff like that? Both. But Both. rehearsing, whenever we went in the studio to... But in rehearsal studios, we'd right, you know, we'd rehearse things, then we'd go in and play some numbers that we'd uh, previously uh, rehearsed, you know, and not put on an album or something. And so they were always there, bubbling, and we we played them a lot. But on on the other hand, I I do pride myself on being able to just step in. To a situation and and do a solo, you know, straight straight in there from scratch. That's uh, that's something which, uh, if you can do that, um, it's it's quite a good string to your bow sort of thing. You can just step in and do a nice solo, you know, for somebody. Oh, absolutely, and the, the thing is too, and the testament to that is, you know, listening to, you know, not only your recent recordings, right, but even just the the, the live Super Champ recordings where you you know you kept some elements of the solos, but you you improvised you know and yeah. i was re-watching some of these the the other night i'm like wow man <laughs> you know he's got chops you know um so it's it's <laughs> it's not um um uh, yeah i mean you absolutely had the, those improvisational abilities and what's what's just you know crazy for me to hear is that you never really had improvisation lessons you you no. just listened and and you know took I you know li just listened a lot and took key elements from people and were was influenced by Cannibal Adderley and all that kind of thing um but you know what I have to ask too I guess going back is that aside from listening like what kind of technical things did you do on your instruments like you know aside from playing scales up and down I mean did were there any special exercises that you did that helped you to build your ability to improvise I used to play um uh etudes from the jimmy dorsey saxophone book tutor huh. jimmy dorsey remember that it's they, there's some great syncopated exercises in there really good yeah um i played scales and long notes and tried to what well, i didn't do it so much back then but what i'm trying to do now i'm trying i'm trying to play tunes and phrases and little i'll make something up it'll just be and then i'll try and play that same thing in every key but my my method at the moment is is not to think about the notes totally not think about the notes just let the notes come uh no the names of the notes that's what i mean don't think about the right. you know except that i know that if i start a phrase on g finish on d for example then i know that if i start the next this if i do the phrase again starting on d it'll finish on a and then if i finish start so that's how i go through the cycle a fifth sort of thing you know but just do it in, in every key and then try and play a um uh, a, a, a ballad or a, a tune and try and play it in every key it, it, it can be quite hard yeah especially when you get to some of the keys not so much for the key signature it's more for the fingerings and stuff it's like how that. the fingering works out yeah it, it's awkward but really specifically i i try not to not to think about the note the notes that i'm playing i know what note i'm going to start on because it, it's obvious it's it's usually the note that the previous phrase is finished on. Um, uh, but uh, really try not to, th once I've started to play this tune starting on D, don't think about what notes, just go to the note. And the more you do it, the more you, you get you get better at it. So, and I think that really helps with improvising. Would you say you're kind of thinking scale degrees in a sense, you know, you're starting on, let's say the one and ending on the five or, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah, just with it's nice to have a little phrase um, that finishes on on a fifth or a fourth, and then you can just keep moving along. Just keep moving 
you don't have to keep thinking about it. It's better to better to do it that way than play a tune that you know starts on A, for example, and then go a semitone up and play the same tune and then go a semitone up and play. I think it's better that way because when you're a semitone different, you, you might remember from before what you did and think, oh, I'll just put it up a semitone, you know, if you try and... Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so in other words, when it comes to, and this is different styles too, right? So when it comes to music that, uh, I'll say Western music and stuff, we move cycle of fifths, you know, and, and yeah. you'll, you, you're thinking musically in the sense of when you're doing these, these, um, these ballads or these phrases, you're thinking about, okay, this will, would logically go to the next, you know, key, temporary key down. Yeah as opposed to, okay, I'm going to practice. I mean, there's value in practicing your patterns and whatever, you know, chromatically and all that type of thing. And depends on the type of music, because if you're doing more modern jazz and bebop, you're going to want to play outside the key and, you know, play up a half step. But for the type of music that you're doing, which is so melodically based, um, that doesn't quite fit. And it's it, it's more, you know, thinking about cycle of fifths and how music naturally resolves and stuff like that. Am I right about that? Yeah, you're right. And I, I'm trying to develop, I'm still trying to develop my ears in that way by playing these playing these tunes and phrases in, in every key uh, without thinking about it. Because if you were just looking at the notes, it's not going to do you any good, for example. You know, if you, if you wrote it down, uh, make a phrase up and write, wrote it down, and then transposed it and wrote it down, and it, that's not doing you any good at all. Well... It's not doing me any good. I'm I'm trying to just uh, get it going in my head without thinking about it at all. Because I think the best music that I I play and solos and whatever it comes from the fact of of not not thinking about what the notes are at all. Just just putting out emotions into the into the music. Yeah, and you know now now that you said that, in thinking back to some of the most iconic solos. Yeah, I can hear that. I can hear that when you think about yeah, it. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about the keys. For example, um, uh, give a little bit. Um, it, I, I, don't, I don't know what key it's in for alto saxophone, but it's, some, it's something way out there. I, I couldn't tell you, because, but I just played something even back then. So without even thinking about what the key was at all just play, play a solo. So that's how it fitted in with that. I think maybe he might be strumming the guitar in E or something. So, you know, I might be in C sharp or whatever, whatever it is. Who knows? Right, right. And it's, it's yeah, you know, so that's interesting. So um, what, it, it, okay, what you're doing right now by, you know, playing in every key and all that kind of thing, this isn't really new because you've, you've, this is how you've always been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've always, I've always just fit, fitted into the music. And interestingly enough, when you play with a guitarist, you necessarily go into all the sharp keys, you know, because they, they, they tend to favor E's and B's and, you know. So we'll see. But playing with a pianist, it's a bit different because they're, they're slightly more flatter keys. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I know. You know, we get the whole we get the whole gamut. And if you play if you play a lot of blues songs, especially guitarists prefer the open strings, which are sharp keys, you know. Yeah. And so and so you have to be adept at that. But that is that is so true with piano players too. They go the opposite way. And you know, like when you're playing a a, a brass or a woodwind instrument, we tend to start off with the flatter keys, you know, just naturally. Um yeah. so, you know, I think we're more no pun intended, but attuned to piano players uh, in the beginning. But it's so important to know the sharp keys as well, you know, for all those yeah. types of, other types of situations and that kind of thing. But exactly, I, I think it's so cool, though, like melodically, you know, how things have, have just come f full circle. Now, you have the, the OK, so like upcoming projects, the super big, the, the um, super big tramp record. It's not released yet, although you have excerpts on your site. Again, I'm going to put the link in the show notes. That's not released oh, yeah. yet. Do you know if it's, will it be released in 2024, you think? Yeah, 99% certain about that. 
Awesome. No, that's good. It, it, and, and, you know, again, everybody, I'm putting the link in the show notes. It's, it's um, man, if you're a super tramp fan like me, just listen to these arrangements because they're so good. They're really so good. Um, the other thing would be, you know, the uh, the latest album, uh, Don't Ever Leave Me. That was that that's your latest album. That wasn't that's not like the, the newest, so to speak, in terms of. Um, well, let me ask you this question. When did that come out? I think it was, it was released. Um, it was actually it was released uh, about a year ago, but it, it was also it re released additionally in um, vinyl. It's a, there's an LP as well. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. And uh, it works really well. <clears throat> and the reason why, well, I think, I think so. Uh, the reason why I found this tune, uh, Don't Ever Leave Me, I, and I first heard it played, played by Keith Jarrett. And I researched the tune, you know, and it's a, it's a really, it's a, a short tune. And the, and the, um, the, uh, the verse to the tune doesn't really work at all. So you only really just play the chorus and, you know, so it, it's not really long. And so I had this idea of um, making, an, making a, an LP and having each side begin and end with a version of don't ever leave me so like bookends oh, I would so say. so on the on the lp you hear don't ever leave me a short version with the quartet and then we play several other tunes and then there's a version of don't ever leave me with three of us or two or whatever and then on the other side it begins with a different combination maybe me playing clarinet and and then ending one of the versions is is just a keyboard pad and and drums oh and just of that tune without this the melody but with the chords so oh. it's kind of an interesting it's a nice little tune nice chords love the tune so there we are that's cool no that that's that's very creative that, that let me ask you this question do you have any plans for any you know any songs that you're working on for a new album just keep thinking about uh, things, especially with the guy that I, I worked with, who's arranged this, uh, uh, he arranged the strings on um, my album, uh, Ever Open Door. He did the string quartet stuff on this album. Okay. Uh, and he also is one of the players and arrangers in the Super Big Tramp Band too. His name is Andy Scott. Uh, so I'm working with him and, and he's got these plans for a string orchestra at some stage so we're just thinking about things i could see I could, nothing yeah. specific as yet that's cool i could i could de definitely yeah. see that especially you know again not just the super tramp music but you know just um seeing you know the style of music you know with your with your recordings as of late and stuff like that um i do i'm gonna do a total left turn here i do have to ask this question um i'm sure that people are curious do you have any interesting stories you know touring stories on the road stories from your days with super tramp we were all we were quite boring in fact we, we didn't drive rolls royce cars into swimming pools or throw tvs out of windows i think one of the reasons why we were not particularly boring but we were quite straight in that way is because when we had to play we had to be very straight um to get all this music right yeah there's a it's not particularly me but it, it's an example of of not being quite right in the head and playing and it's we before quite soon after i joined supertramp we went to play at, on the island of jersey we flew there and we we did somebody's wedding and we're playing in this big we're playing outside this real massive house with, with that all sorts of uh it was more it was halfway between a house and a castle and outside the front of the house there, there was some um, uh cannons uh, cannons set up you know big cannons like they had on ships you know, they were set up on either side of the door so we were we were playing a set and um bob the drummer had, had had rather too much to drink before the performance uh, and we played the first we played our first half and he wasn't he wasn't very good in terms of nailing it you know he wasn't he wasn't 100% so 
at, at halftime, he realised that and he went and drank loads of coffee to sober himself up. And then we were just starting the second half and uh, Dougie Thompson, the bass player, he dropped his plectrum on, on the floor and, and bent down to get it and smashed his head on the cannon. <laughs> oh my God. And so Bob had sobered up by the, by the second half, but Dougie was all over the place because he, he got concussion. <laughs> So that's just an example of not being right. And it, it was it was Bob that vowed after that gig, he vowed never, ever to drink before a performance. You know, he did. He drank afterwards, you know, a lot. But never, never before a performance would, it, would he drink. And he kept to that, you know, for decades. So that that's kind of a nice thing to say about you know about somebody else in fact but uh good little story no and, and <clears throat> what's interesting is that people think that um well <clears throat> you know a lot of people tend to drink a lot before they play and sometimes it's for nerves because they you know they get really nervous and they feel like they that's what they need to do but like you know i know for me i don't like to drink i don't like to drink before i play because i do want to be very aware of what i'm doing um and so it's yes. really cool to hear that story, you know, from from you know one of the most popular bands of all time. How you know, you, because your 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 arrangements and everything were so intricate, you, you really had to be on top of your game. And you know, drinking could have could have messed that up. So, oh, absolutely, and it, I'm sure it's messed a lot of people up. And obviously, drinking is a bit more conducive for certain other types of music, perhaps. But seeing as we we were pretty together, but but the the main thing about doing gigs is that at eight p.m. or whenever the gig starts, and and maybe there's ten thousand people there, or five thousand, or even if there's only three people, you've got a great responsibility because, however your own days gone or your own week leading up to that point it's not it should never be the concern of the pe people that are going, going to see you you know you come on stage and you you've got this obligation to be as great as you, as good as you can be and so that's what that's how we viewed it with uh, with doing gigs with the band can i ask about that too um i that's 100 absolutely with that have you did you ever you know did you ever get nervous before you p would perform you know and if you did like how did you deal with it uh no only but the, the exception that proves the rule I interesting never nervous at all with, with super Jam. and when i went to college uh and and mingled and studied with the younger younger people and then occasionally we'd have to go and do uh perform little concerts of, of ourselves, uh, you know, our, on our, our pieces that we're learning, uh, uh, classical pieces, shall we say. Uh, and I got really nervous performing for six or eight people who, who were just there, other, other, young, other young saxophonists. And I, I don't know why I wasn't as confident, you know, in, in what, I was, what I was doing. And I used to get quite nervous then. What, what do you think led to you are not and and this is even before super tramp right in your very earliest of days what what led to not being nervous like i'm trying to th if there's any tips you can give people it was a, a a genuine reliance on how the other people there are performing especially uh, the drums and the bass, especially the basis of, of everything. I just knew that nothing was ever going to go wrong be behind, you know. So it, I'm just floating on this carpet of, of solidity. And so I didn't have to worry about any of that. And I was quite, uh, we'd rehearsed, we knew what we were doing. That's yeah. a key part. And, you know, it's interesting what you just said too, just really having that solid rhythm section you know, again, it doesn't matter the style, but, you know, yeah. knowing that the, you know, bass and drums are just solid, you know, like, so like Absolutely. when you solo, when you improvise now and stuff like that, um, w and let's say it's, um, let's say it's a five piece, you know, let's say you also have guitar in the mix too. Like, what are you keying in on? Are you keying in on, on the bass or, you know, what are you doing? Oh, it's just everything really. Everything uh, um, 
Yeah, it's the whole, it's just the whole sound. Uh, and one of my things about playing is that don't overdo it. That's what, that, that was our sort of philosophy with Supertramp. Uh, if there's a solo, don't, don't solo for too long. Just solo, keep it, keep it, you know, within the realms of possibility and, and not, uh, don't go too far. Don't go too far, because uh, people get bored, you know what I mean? And that's part of the thing of my trying to keep it melodic as well, you know. Don't, don't, don't do too much. Do, do less rather than more. Leave people wanting more. That's awesome, and that's that's great advice. And I, I wanted to end with, um, you had alluded to this before when you first got your Mark VI, you know, and how it's such a great horn. You said there was a oh. story later on about that. I played this, that that same tenor saxophone that I bought in 1964 for 145. It was actually it was actually 145 guineas, and a guinea back in those days, uh, well, uh, was a one pound and one shilling. Oh, okay. it was an, it was like an old form of, of of, and they used to sell expensive items like. Rolls Royce cars or fur coats. It, the the price would be in guineas. You know, it'd be sixty guineas or thousand guineas. Anyway, so it was one pound one shilling, and so it was one hundred and forty five guineas for this saxophone in its case, with a new case and everything. So, anyway, I played this saxophone for for years. It's a, it's the saxophone I played at the solo on Crime of the Century. Bloody well right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, in 1997, I, I I went to Roberto's in New York, and I found a, a Mark VI, another Mark VI saxophone, and it was it was one of the ones that he has on the wall there. And I, I tried a few of them. This this one just wow, this one this is a, a great horn. Uh, and so I, I bought I bought myself a, a new a new one. Well, I still had the old one, and uh, uh, I was very happy about that. And then, after I'd been playing that for a few years, I so, sort of had the thing of uh, well, I shouldn't be I shouldn't really have two two tenors. What do I need two Mark Six tenors for? You know. So, and, but then in the meantime, I got to know uh, a Frenchman that uh, called Laurent Hunziker. And he's he's a guy that, that had had three jobs. He was a bus driver, a photographer, and a saxophonist in uh, in a Super Tramp tribute band called the Logical Tramp. Oh wow! Yeah, this is good. And and so eventually, I uh, I let Laurent have that saxophone. I, I sold it to him, uh, and so Laurent now plays that same saxophone in the Logical Tramp band, and he plays the solo on Crime of the Century, and he plays the, the saxophone. He plays, the, you know, all the tenor solos that uh, are Super Tramp ones. He plays like, um, uh, I would play, uh, It's Raining Again, for example, is on that same saxophone. So, yeah, so uh, I, I get to see the, the, the instrument occasionally because he's my friend, you know. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This is okay. This is a great way to end because there's so many things that are full circle, right? <laughs> the saxophone, <laughs> the Mark six, you know, and then seeing yeah. someone else, you know, play it. And then, you know, they're, they're a, a tribute band, right? Well, it happened. Um, interestingly enough, um, although I sat in with this band about 20 years ago uh, in a, a small town in, in the UK and just played, I played my solo of the logical song. I played it on a Grafton um, alto saxophone. You know, the sort of plastic ones, those yeah. ones? Yeah, I've got one of those. It's quite nice. Anyway, I did that. And, but he's been my friend for a long time. And uh, they finally persuaded me to go. Uh, and two weeks ago, I went to Paris to join this Logical Tramp in a concert at a really nice concert hall that they played there, Sal Playel. And I joined the the band, the Logical Tramps, for several numbers, That's and so I, I'm I'm there with my with my newer to me saxophone, 
and and Laurent is there with my old old one too. So we're playing together, which was really nice. That's so cool. <laughs> that is that is so cool. That's awesome. That's a circle. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is the circle for sure. Um, well, listen, John. I want to thank you for your time. You've been so generous with it. And, you know, this has been kind of like a, you know, when I first contacted you in, you know, I think it was 2014 or something like that, nine years ago, I didn't have a podcast or anything like that. Um, I was just about starting the my BAM radio show, but it was more for music educators, but it never would have occurred to me. I mean, to think back then that, you know, nine years later, I'd be speaking to you for the Everything Saxophone podcast and interviewing you. Um, yeah, it's just, it's so cool for me too. And and I'm sure it's really cool for all the listeners to hear, you know, hear about you and, and your projects, but also some of these stories and, and you know, um, some tips and all that kind of thing. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. It's been nice talking to you.